Will you please stand for the reading of God's Word? I'll be reading Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. Acts 16, 1 through 15. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they came up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, we are coming out of our Christmas series and we are back to the book of of Acts. Uh, as I was looking at the calendar, we actually started our series and study of Acts a year, almost to the day ago. And so if you are newer here and are curious about where we've been in Acts, getting up to, verse, uh, up to, up to chapter 16, uh, all of those sermons are available online or on the app, and you can get up to speed with where we're at right now. Um, we are entering into the new year, and there's something that many of us are doing as this new year starts. Uh, we are thinking through resolutions, right? We're thinking about 2021. We don't want to think about 2021 too much, do we? No, we don't. But we're thinking about 2021. We're thinking about what we would have done differently, what we would like to change. We're hoping that 2022 is going to be better than 2021. Amen? And that is a very low bar to set. Um, But we're also thinking about what we want to be, what we want to give ourselves to. We're dreaming about what the next year might look like. You might be thinking about education, vocation, finances, family, travel, whatever. And, uh, And so we've got our resolutions we're working on. And this text, I think, is... Um, uniquely helpful for a moment like this, a time in which we are evaluating the past and thinking about the future. So what I want to do is I want to examine three exhortations or three calls that we can draw from this text. They are the call to wisdom, the call to discipline, and the call to openness. The call to wisdom, the call to discipline, and the call to openness. We'll start with the call to wisdom. This is going to be the longest point of the three. We need to back up a little bit to understand what's happening in Acts 16. Uh, in, In Acts 15, which Pastor Brandon preached on, we have Luke telling us about the Jerusalem council. And what happened was the leaders of the church were coming together to make theological and practical decisions uh, for all of the churches that were spread out. The churches were dealing with issues and questions. These were, some of these were practical issues and questions. Some of these were theological issues and questions. And the real issue, the real conflict was this. What does it look like for believing Jews and believing Gentiles to live as equals in the family of God? What does it look like for a Jew who believes in Christ and a Gentile who believes in Christ 
to live together as co-equals in the family of God. The Jews, of course, are bringing with them their tradition, their history, their Judaism, and the Gentiles, of course, are not bringing any of that, but they are bringing some of their own things. And so the question is, what does it look like for them to live together? And at the very center of this conflict is the issue of circumcision, right? This is no small issue in the New Testament. In fact, circumcision is the issue of conflict in the book of Acts. It's the issue principally in the book of um, Colossians. It is also the issue in the book of Galatians. It, we, we need to avoid the error of underemphasizing how important this was. This was such a significant issue that we have the Jerusalem Council. We have the apostles and all of them coming together to figure out how do we navigate this. So at that council, they came together, Peter uh, and Paul and others, and been witnessing what God was doing by his spirit in the churches and other regions. They came together And they made a decision. They handed this decision down. And that was that circumcision, uh, which was was the covenant sign of the Jews, circumcision would not be required of Gentile converts to Christianity. Of course, a bunch of guys took a deep breath when they heard that, right? So this is not required of Gentile converts to Christianity. Rather, they affirmed that faith alone in Christ alone was the basis and the only basis of their salvation. Christ is the only faithful covenant-keeping Jew. He has lived the perfect life of obedience that we were commanded to live, And he had died the sinner's death on the cross in our place, taking the judgment that we had deserved. Christ had was raised from the dead, according to the scriptures, on the third day, and he had conquered all of our enemies. So faith and faith alone in Christ alone is all that is required for salvation. It is not required for Gentile uh, believers to be circumcised. So that's the decision that they came to. That's the decision that is going to be handed down, and, and, and Paul is going to travel to these churches to deliver this decision. Now, that's what's happening in Acts 16. Now, Paul is going to travel to these churches, to these communities, and to deliver them the verdict of the Jerusalem council. And to aid him in his work, Paul appoints Timothy. Luke tells us, Excuse me, Luke tells us that Timothy's mother was a Jew and that she was a believer. She had converted to Christianity, but Timothy's father was not a Jew. He was a Greek, and consequently, Timothy was not circumcised. So we read in verse 3, it says, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Jew. Greek. So here's what's going on here. You need to see this tension because we're talking about wisdom. The Jerusalem Council says circumcision is not necessary for salvation. When Paul is going to take Timothy to travel to the churches to deliver this verdict, Timothy gets circumcised. And so the question is, what gives? What are we to make of this? The council said it's not required. What does Paul do? He takes Timothy and he gets circumcised. We want to up the ante a little bit. Consider the way that Paul speaks of this in Galatians chapter 2. It says, But when Cephas, that is Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood Condemned. Peter stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like 
Jews. Again, the issue is circumcision. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Okay? So here, this is very interesting. Paul is... Excuse me. Good thing nobody's in the front row. Paul is publicly calling out Peter. He's calling him out publicly. And he says, this is wrong. To his face, he's calling him out over this issue of circumcision. And he tells Peter that he is out of line with the gospel. This is no peripheral thing. This is not a small issue. What Peter is doing is inconsistent with the gospel because he is treating uncircumcised believers differently as if second class believers, he treats them differently than he would treat the Jewish circumcised believers. And what Paul is saying is that this is to do this and to require this and to act this way is a different gospel. In fact, it is no gospel at all. He opens the book of Galatians by saying, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That is, if you bring anything, you add anything to this gospel, you change anything but faith in Christ alone, let you, let him be eternally condemned. Adding anything to faith in Christ as a requirement for salvation is saying that Jesus is not enough. To require circumcision for salvation, in Paul's words, is anti-gospel. It is anti-gospel. But when Paul takes Timothy into these Jewish communities, he has him circumcised. So what do we make of it? Is there a contradiction here? Is there a double standard? Is Paul acting one way with one group of people and a different way with another group of people? Is he saying one thing here and doing another thing there? We need wisdom. Wisdom requires a commitment to thinking deeply, and it requires a commitment to bold obedience. You have to understand there is a world of difference between Timothy being circumcised willingly out of respect for a people and a culture and Timothy being circumcised as a requirement for salvation. Those are two different things. Timothy's saying, I want to respect these people. We're going to go into the culture. I'm going to be circumcised. That's one thing. And Timothy being circumcised because they say, if you're not circumcised, you're not a Christian. You're not saved. Those are two very different things. Timothy was not being circumcised in order to capitulate to a false gospel that required something more than faith in Christ. You and I can be certain that if something more than faith in Christ was required of Timothy for salvation, neither Timothy nor Paul would have had anything to do with it. We know that because Paul in Galatians 5, 2 says, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, meaning as a necessary act for salvation, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Those are heavy words. If you do this, you're saying Christ is nothing. Circumcision to respect A people, a culture, a history is fine. It is even, in this case, commendable. But circumcision as a capitulation to a false gospel is absolutely forbidden. The motive matters. The reasons matter. It requires wisdom. It requires us to think deeply about these issues. And this is the kind of thinking and wisdom that we need in this unique cultural moment for the church in North America. We need wisdom. 
not quick answers, not easy answers. We need wisdom. Consider this right now. The church is being told by the world how it is supposed to behave. The church is being told by the world what loving our neighbors looks like. The church is being told by the world how to act and how not to act. And it gets really compelling when someone says, love your neighbor. Well, how could you argue with love your neighbor? Andrew Sandlin said this, and he is spot on. While Christian leaders can be sincere but misled, there can be little doubt that the chief impetus behind the current wholesale defection is simply craven compromise, the desire to curry favor and popularity in an apostate age suckled on individual autonomy. Okay, what does that mean? It means this. Right now, the prevailing wisdom in our day, in our culture, in the church, says this. Do whatever the world asks you to do in the spirit of loving your neighbor and for the sake of the mission. Whatever they say, do it. Whatever they require, do it. Don't push back. Don't question. Don't talk about sin. Whatever they say, Do it, because after all, we're supposed to love our neighbors. Are we to love our neighbors? Absolutely. Yet, we must never allow the world to refine, redefine what Christian love for neighbor looks like. Love for neighbor will always look like obedience to the world. You know who loved their neighbor more than anybody else ever? You know who did that? Christ. Did the world love him? No. No, he got himself killed for things that he said. We must love our neighbors, but we must not allow the world to define what Christian love looks like. We must think deeply and be committed to bold obedience. We need wisdom. We need wisdom to navigate these issues and answer these questions. The world does not need right now to see a church that capitulates to the world. The world needs to see the wisdom of Christ manifest in the church. There always must be a clear distinction between the world and the church. If there is no distinction between the world and the church, the church is not being the church. It's simply being the world. The distinction matters. Without that distinction, there is no witness and there is no conversion. So the world needs to see the wisdom of Christ manifest in the church Not a church that is eager to abandon the wisdom of Christ or the word of God in favor of the approval of the world. Make no mistake, that is what is going on right now. And it's just not the world that is telling us to do this. It's organizations, Christian organizations, leaders, authors, people that we have loved and trusted. So what does it mean for us to... Be called to wisdom and to think through these things. Well, first of all, we must do all that we can to love and respect and honor those who are around us. We must do that because Christ has commanded us to do that. That's not optional. We must love our neighbor as ourself. However, as we seek to love our neighbor as ourself, we cannot allow the world or anyone else to redefine what biblical love looks like. We cannot allow anyone to redefine what biblical love looks like. What does that mean? That means we can never compromise on issues of sin. It, it is heartbreaking to watch In our own community, people who profess to be believers, who are embracing lives that are utterly irreconcilable with the scriptures, 
And to see other Christians publicly celebrate this and say, this is love. Love does not compromise on issues of sin. So we must love our neighbor, but we must not compromise on issues of sin. We must not compromise on the truth of the gospel. There is a real historical biblical Jesus And there is a pseudo, fake, false, cultural Jesus. They're not the same. And if you're going to love your neighbor, you're going to have to call that out. Because the false Jesus cannot save. Thirdly, we can never compromise on the clear teaching of the scriptures. When scriptures forbid or condemn anything, and we see people wholeheartedly embracing these things, you cannot celebrate that. You're not loving them when you celebrate it. Can you love them and oppose that decision? Yes, but you need wisdom. We need wisdom to think through these issues. The second is the call to discipline. The call to discipline. Verses six through seven. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. This has to be some of the weirdest verses in the book of Acts, right? You think about what's going on here. The Spirit of God forbid the Apostle Paul and his team to go into Asia and to preach the gospel? Does that make any sense? And then it says the Spirit of Jesus did not allow Paul and his mission team to go in Bithynia? How how does that work? There is, again, the need for wisdom. There is a fundamental difference between strategic planning vision and opportunity and the leading of the Spirit of God. There's a distinction between those things. You have to acknowledge on one hand, it would have made a lot of sense for Paul to travel into Asia to continue preaching, to establish and nourish churches. And of course, it would have made a lot of sense for Paul to go into Bithynia. In fact, it's not hard to imagine Paul and his team getting together, coming to a local church saying, hey, we want to go preach the gospel in Asia. There's a need for, uh, for, for preaching and churches and planting and all that stuff. So we're going to go do this and we want to raise money so that we can train leaders and send teams. And almost everybody has said, how could, you, how could you say no to the mission of planting churches in Asia? How could you say no? to sending Paul and this team into Bithynia. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? Doesn't that sound like something that we should all get behind? It would have made great strategic sense. It would have been what some people call a great gospel opportunity. But you have to understand here, there is a difference between, again, strategy, vision, and opportunities and the leading of the Spirit of God. They're not the same thing. They're not always different things, meaning we should not assume if there's an opportunity that is before us that that's obviously not the thing God wants us to do. We shouldn't assume that. But we also should not assume that every opportunity is something that God is calling us into. An opportunity, a great opportunity, is not the same as God's will and his plan or his timing, and his desire. We have to be disciplined to submit to the Spirit of God in all things. Sometimes there will be things that make a whole lot of sense that the Spirit of God is saying no to. That's clearly happening in this text. This gets very practical for us as a church as we think about this next year and some of the dreams that we have and the challenges uh, that we are facing um, together. Uh, We've talked about this a number of times. We have outgrown our facility. 
Uh, we barely have enough room on Sundays, even with three of our morning services. We have no designated staff office space. If you come here for kids' community or youth community, you will see a building absolutely bursting uh, at the seams with uh, kids everywhere, which is a fantastic thing, right? It's a fantastic thing, but we're just out of space. Uh, in addition to that, we have a heart to see a church planted in North Kitsap, hopefully soon. We have a heart to see something established in South Kitsap. There is increasing talk amongst many people at our church um, about the need to provide Christian education for our kids as our local school boards have lost their minds. So here's the question. What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Where should we invest resources? How do we address building issues and space issues? What should our next step be? What are our priorities? You think about all the opportunities and all the challenges and all the needs, and it feels overwhelming because it is overwhelming. It's a lot to think about. And as we navigate these challenges, what we need more than a compelling vision and what we need more than a strategic plan and what we need more than a great opportunity is we need the Spirit of God to lead us according to the will of God. And you know what? Sometimes that won't make sense. Sometimes in the moment, that will make no sense at all. Why not Asia? Why not Bithynia? Because the Spirit said so. That's why. Vision isn't bad. Strategy isn't bad. Opportunities aren't bad. But they're not the same as being led by the Spirit of God according to the will of God. God will sometimes close doors on you that seem like a once-in-a-lifetime great opportunity. Sometimes he will steer you clear of things that seem like the perfect setup. And the reason he's doing that is because he has something else. We must submit to the Spirit of God. And of course, this is not just true of us as a church together. This is true of you and your individual life and your family as you think about this year. You're looking at opportunities. There's challenges you have. You might be thinking about relocating. You might be thinking about a different job. You might be thinking about whatever, right? Ask all of those questions. Do all of the research, but don't forget to ask the most important question. What does God want? Where is God leading us in this? What does the Spirit of God want? Now, let me put some guardrails on this, okay? It's not wise for you to figure out what the Spirit of God wants for you all by yourself. So ask some trusted, mature Christians as you are praying and trying to figure that out. Talk with others and know this. The Spirit of God will never lead you in a way or a direction that is inconsistent with the Word of God. Never. So seek the Spirit. And ask God to give you direction and ask, what does God want? We need to seek the Spirit of God in all things and ask that he would give us the discipline to wait upon him for his leading and for his direction. Lastly, the call to openness. Verses 13 through 14, it says, On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So Paul was going to go to Asia. The Spirit says no. Paul's going to go to Bithynia. The Spirit says No. So he ends up here by this river having a time of prayer. They had submitted to the direction of the Holy Spirit. They'd gathered for prayer, 
and happened to connect with a group of women. And in that group of women, there happened to be one woman who was Lydia, okay? What does Luke tell us about Lydia? He says that the Lord opened her heart and she ended up getting baptized and her and her whole household came to faith. So we will not at this point go into detail and how here a a prominent businesswoman in the first century was not put off by Christianity, was not offended by the understanding of gender roles, did not see Christianity as a threat to her femininity, but was rather drawn to the beauty and the truth of the gospel and was converted and then used by God to do great things. We won't go into that right now, okay? (laughs) But I do want you to notice the nature of the interaction that takes place. Did Paul have some strategy to connect with Lydia? There's nothing. Did Paul have some great plan to, how can we woo the women of this town into the church and convert them to Christianity? Did he do that? No. What did he do? He just got together and prayed. He just got together and prayed, and some women overheard it, and it led to a conversation Before you know, Lydia and her family is baptized. Long before Paul ever rolled into town with his team, God was at work with Lydia. It was God who was pursuing Lydia. It was God who was working on her heart. And it was God who was drawing her to himself. This conversion has nothing to do with some great strategy by Paul. It has nothing to do with a a catchy slogan or a campaign or some slick presentation with laser beams. It has everything to do with the sovereign grace of God. God is the pursuer. God is the missionary. God is the one who is saving. And so it is the sovereign grace of God doing what? Just using the simple obedience of Christians coming together to pray with no great vision or some strategy or or, or anything like that. They're just being obedient, and God uses that to connect Lydia with the gospel. What does that mean for us? Too often we overthink things. We make everything way too complicated This conversion of Lydia reminds us that what you and I need to focus on doing is simply being faithful to obey what God has clearly commanded us to do. You want to change the world? Do the little things. Be faithful and obedient in the little things and be open to the opportunities that God is going to put right in front of you. God is going to drop Lydia's into your life. You worry about obeying him. He does the pursuing. He arranges the appointments. And he does the saving. Just be obedient and faithful with the little things that are right in front of you. Uh, Every Christmas season or most Christmas seasons, um, we, our family, tries to bless somebody in need. And sometimes that means just participating with whatever uh, program we're doing here and and helping an organization and people in our community. And sometimes it means there's another opportunity outside that just presents itself and, and we go for that. So this year we're in the Christmas season and, and I find out about a need. Someone has a need. And I knew immediately I was supposed to meet that need. God had dropped that right in my lap. He put it right in front of me, and I was supposed to meet it. I wasn't going looking for it. There was no strategy. There was no plan, right? It was just, here's the need. Oh, we can meet that need. And so we sought to be faithful and obedient with that simple need that God put right in front of us. You know what? It's really fun to do. Have you ever done that? A need just pops up out of the blue, and you're like, yep, the Spirit says you should take care of that. And you take care of it, and there's joy in it. There's a joy because you are being part, you are participating in what God is doing in that person's life. And so we did it, and there was joy in it. 
Friends, that story just can be repeated over and over and over again. We can know for certain that God is at work in our community. God is already pursuing people in our own community, in Kitsap County. He's working on them. He's drawing them. He is arranging the circumstances in their life to get them to the point where they are going to connect with a person, an individual, who will share the gospel with them. God is already working in the lives of your coworkers. God is working in the lives of the neighbors you can't stand. God is already pursuing them. All you need to do is be obedient and faithful and open. And God will present you with those opportunities. Be obedient and be open to the things, the ordinary small things that God puts right in front of you. Our community is full of Lydia's. People that God is already after. And he's looking for people to just simply be obedient and faithful. And he will use your simple faith and obedience to bring them to Christ. Friends, we must be wise It is a complicated time with questions and issues that we've never had to face before. We need the mind and the wisdom of Christ. And we need to be submitted to the Spirit of God in all things. And we need to be prepared and open to the opportunities God brings before us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we enter into this new year, we want to be a people of wisdom, of people who do have and know the mind of Christ, of people who are not swayed by the world, but of people who are obedient to you and to your word. Lord, give us hearts that are quick to submit to your spirit in all things. Give us a unique sensitivity to the spirit. And Lord, make us open to the things that you are doing right in front of us. Make us eager to enter into that work that you have for us, whatever it may be, wherever it may be. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.